Hi, I couldn't help overhearing you in the shop. I'm Nikki Martin. Sorry about Daddy. It was meant to be the beginning of a new career. At 21, Karita Ridgway was already an accomplished model and now trying to make it in the movies. But first, this young beauty wanted to take a working holiday and, like thousands of other Australian girls, boarded a plane for Tokyo. So Karita had never expressed any concerns about this job at all? No, she hadn't. Um, I think they just thought it was a bit of a laugh, really. Yeah. Easy money. What happened to Karita in Japan has, until now, been a mystery. It's a horrifying story. A story of rape and murder, and men who prey on innocent young Australian women. Sexual violation to a stripper or hostess would happen every night. Every night. Every night an Australian girl is abused? Yep, yep. Every night. And is it reported to police? No. This is Tokyo's red light district, Roppongi. It's a Saturday night, and like millions of other Japanese men, Mr. Sagawa is looking for love. And in particular, the love of a young Western girl. Especially white young girls. You just love young white girls? Yeah, um, blonde hair and... Uh, and blue eyes and white skin. Mr Sagawa's heart has already been broken once by a young Australian dancer whom he showered with gifts and money. And where is this? In Canada, Toronto. So you went on holidays together? Yes. But the 22-year-old Melbourne girl was lucky for she quickly learned that her mild-mannered boyfriend had a despicable secret. I Really, I wanted to eat her. She looks very delicious. For the shocking truth about Isi Sagawa is that he's a psychopath, a killer. He's Japan's most notorious cannibal. First part I ate is from her hips. Yeah. I don't know why, but uh, the hips of the girls really attract me. Mm. It was in Paris 20 years ago that we first heard about Isi Sagawa. One night he lured a young woman named Rene Hartfeld to his apartment. There he shot her, methodically cooked her, then ate her body. But Isi Sagawa got away with murder. Judged incurably insane by a French court, he was deported back to Japan. And once there, his influential and very wealthy father ensured that he's never spent a day in jail. A lot of pictures with beautiful girls. There certainly are a lot of pictures. Yeah. Here in his bedroom, Sagawa proudly keeps a record of his obsession. Now he'd like another Australian girlfriend, preferably one that he can add to his trophy wall. Are you shocked? You, you, yes, I'm shocked. I, I know I'm That's crazy. What's... I'm crazy. <laughs> so don't, please don't uh, hate me. This is Isi Sagawa's hunting ground. It's a lawless place. Here, the mafia is in control. The police are paid to look the other way. They have a private lap dance area. Uh, it's like next door, but everybody's naked. And on any given night, there are more than 500 girls from Australia working at bars like this. They're the fresh meat, as, as uh, they call them over there. The fresh meat? The fresh meat, oh, yeah. Were you working for the Yakuza, the Japanese mafia? The owner of the company is under the control of the Yakuza. Rob Cox has broken the Yakuza's code of silence. He's an insider. He once worked for a Tokyo strip club. Cox says it's a world where money can buy you anything. Sex, drugs and even the police. The police and the Yakuza work hand in hand to make sure that the sex industry keeps spinning around and around 
sometimes you can make up to 10 grand a week or more, you know. Like every Australian girl who arrives here, Vanessa had to make a choice. She could work in a hostess bar, which involved nothing more than talking with Japanese businessmen, or for four times the money, she could become a stripper. Part of the job entails, does it not, dealing with perfect strangers who do want to touch you? Yeah. So what do you do about that? Well, that's why most of the girls um, get mixed up with, you know, alcohol and drugs. It has to be said that not all of the young Australians who arrive here succumb to this lifestyle. One was Carita Ridgway, the aspiring actress who'd been trying out for movie parts back home. Look up. Oh, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> she had a great sense of humour. Uh, she used to keep us in stitches as a kid because she'd mimic all her teachers at school and uh, she'd have them down pat. Carita's dad, Nigel, wasn't worried when she left for Japan in 1991 and found a job in a hostess bar. Did she ever express feeling unsafe? No, no. In fact, the opposite. They said that they always felt safe. But then Carita was asked to go out on a dohan, a Japanese practice where clubs allow a customer to take a hostess out on a date. In most cases, the girl will take, the, will go for dinner with the customer. Like the customer will take you to Ginza, take you shopping, buy you Gucci, you know, shoes, handbags, that sort of thing. Once you're taken away, anything can happen. Oh, definitely. I think, well, obviously it's very dangerous. One of Carita's first dough hands was with this man, a wealthy and well-connected playboy called Joji Ibarra. Most of the girls who are hostesses are asked to go out on dough hands, which are dates with customers. Were you aware of that? No, I wasn't. In fact, you having mentioned it just now, it's the first time I knew that that was part of the deal. Joji Abara seemed charming and invited Karita back to one of his luxury apartments for a drink. Within hours, she was in a coma and taken to hospital. Obara told the doctors it was something she ate. Karita died here in Tokyo Women's Hospital without regaining consciousness. Doctors ruled that she'd been suffering from hepatitis. When Karita's family asked the Japanese police to investigate, they were fobbed off, even laughed at. It was to be the first in a series of extraordinary blunders by the Japanese police. Blunders that would allow Ibarra to continue to drug and rape young women for the next eight years. She was very vivacious, uh, hugely entertaining uh, young lady. Five years ago, Lucy Blackman told her dad, Tim, she was heading off to Japan. And it seemed an entirely safe and a standard thing to do, really. She too got a job as a hostess, and like Carita Ridgway, was taken out on a dohan by a charming English-speaking Japanese man who invited her down to his apartment on the coast. It was the last time Lucy Blackman was seen alive. As, as British people, we are surprised and upset that such a terrible thing could happen to our child by now, Tim Blackman was pursuing his own leads. One name kept coming up, Joji Obama. Various girls came to us and related this story about being taken to the coast and uh, being uh, date raped. Tim Blackman's pressure finally forced the police to act. They raided Obama's seaside haunt. This was the outcome the Blackman family had feared but expected the discovery of a woman's remains. Lucy's dismembered body was found in a shallow grave in a beachside cave just metres from Abara's apartment. How her body could have gone undiscovered for so long is still a mystery. What we do know is that Joji Obara brought hundreds of young Western women here. 
The pattern was always the same. He'd offer the girl a drink, spike with a knockout drug, then rape her while she was unconscious. When Japanese police finally raided his apartment, they found more than a thousand tapes. Obara had recorded his own crimes, the rape of more than 150 women. Some of the women identified on the tapes were Australian. One of them was Karita Ridgway, the 21-year-old from Perth. Now, 10 years later, her family is finally being told the truth. Karita didn't die of hepatitis at all, but from the drugs Obara had used while he raped her. It gives another dimension of like horror and disgust. Um, it's just a horrible feeling to think that you know your child has been violated by <coughs> by somebody. Obara has not been charged with the murder of either Karita Ridgway or Lucy Blackman. Instead, he's on trial for much lesser charges. Abduction, rape resulting in death, and improper disposal of a body. What do you believe Lucy's case has exposed about this Japanese society? I think the only thing it actually shows is that the Japanese aren't going to change, unfortunately. And the risk for Australian girls still remains. In the seedy hostess clubs of Roppongi, it's business as usual as we discovered when we followed Isi Sagawa on a night out. Here, Japan's most notorious criminal quickly found just what he was looking for. Three young Australian women. Mr Sagawa introduced himself as his favourite secret agent. My name is James Bond, OK? And chatted happily to the unsuspecting girls. Moths, yes. I, I, I'm very scared of them. Oh, they're nothing to yeah. be scared of. They're cute. Yeah. Isi Sagawa swears that these young women have nothing to fear from him. Never. Never. At least um, kill. Never. Of course, I want to eat the meat of the young, beautiful girls. It was uh, not change at all. You still want but, to eat the girls, you just yeah, don't want to kill the girls. Yeah, so um, I, I know now the killing is really terrible. So I ne uh, for, for eating, I never kill. Cheers. By the time he left, all three of these trusting young Australians had handed him their private phone numbers. Outside, we politely took the girls' phone numbers back from him. How dangerous do you believe the Roppongi bars and strip clubs are for young foreign girls? Of course, it's very, very dangerous because um, the customers are very rich. They can do anything, everything. 